keynote address, I have the honor to welcome and introduce the Honorable Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Teodoro Eloxin Jr. First, allow me to congratulate everyone on the entry into force for the Philippines of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The Philippines is the 53rd state to ratify the DPNW and the sixth ASEAN member state to do so. But my predecessor, Foreign Affairs Secretary Alan Peter Cayetano, was among the first to sign it. This ratification builds on the Philippines' principled policy and commitment towards the complete prohibition of nuclear weapons. Article 2, Section 8 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution reads, The Philippines, consistent with the national interest, adopts and pursues a policy of freedom from nuclear weapons in its territory. No agreement is possible for the establishment of foreign military bases, let alone can the presence of foreign forces in our territory armed with nuclear weapons be accepted or tolerated. All foreign nations must respect this basic policy of freedom from nuclear weapons, either leave or never enter. Article 2 of the TPNW obliges the Philippines to officially declare to all member states our opposition to the unwanted, indeed unconstitutional presence of such weapons inside our territory, inland or at sea. Thus, the Philippines regards the TPNW as an additional legal arm to enhance our constitutional duty and the national defense. To the degree foreign powers respect our constitution, to that extent, our friendship with them goes. The presence of nuclear weapons in our waters or thereabouts invites the nuclear holocaust the TPNW abjures and commits its members to do all in their power to prevent. As Philippine permanent representative at the UN, I explained that in 1971, the five original members of the then new reformed ASEAN, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, while the region raged with the worst proxy war in history, adopted the ASEAN zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality with a nuclear weapons-free region clearly in mind and firmly resolved, just in case it occurs to the great power protagonists to go that far. In 1997, the Bangkok Treaty establishing the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons-Free Zone went into effect. It is now considered the strongest convention of its kind. Working on the principle that denying nuclear powers an entire region as platform for launching or as a target of their nuclear weapons is a giant step toward the nuclear weapons free world. We are fully aware of how this goes against the grain of nuclear deterrence theory. A doctrine to give credit to its authors that kept the world from total extinction though at the price of great conventional carnage. Prohibition may not be a sure path to peace, but it is a broader road for human survival. Estimated casualties from conventional as opposed to limited nuclear exchanges may not be much less, but will tackle one challenge at a time. In 2010, Philippine Ambassador to the UN, Libran Kabaktulan, became the president of the review conference of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. He pushed hard for the inclusion of discussions and conclusions on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons in the conference's final agreed outcome document. He achieved progress that no subsequent conference has attained, even as much progress was whittled away since then. For the first time, there was a heightened move to highlight the humanitarian, or rather, the anti-humanitarian dimension of the use of nuclear weapons, which includes the threat of humanity's extinction, 
if not as a whole, then in great unacceptable swaths. This paved the way for a concerted international action to completely ban the most sweepingly lethal and destructive of weapons invented by man. This led to 135 nations, including the Philippines, participating in negotiations for a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. 122 countries voted in favor of the adoption of the final text of the TPNW. It reflected the clear and unequivocal intention of the international community to ban nuclear weapons and emphasizing the humanitarian consequences of their wider deployment and thereby greater temptation to use. This was without the participation and ratification of the nuclear armed states and the P-5. But it was not a vain and futile gesture. The prohibition has very real strategic consequences. It changes whole theaters of possible nuclear war and the temporal dynamic of nuclear exchanges, even if by seconds. The TPNW strengthens and reaffirms the MPT as the capstone of the long-standing, if perennially inconclusive, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. More importantly, it explicitly bans nuclear weapons and at the same time establishes a means for the P-5 and the nuclear armed states to take concrete steps towards nuclear disarmament if they are at all serious. As the TPNW enters into force in the Philippines, and as we prepare for the first meeting of state parties scheduled on January 12, 14, 2022, let us keep in mind that the entry into force of this treaty is a great and auspicious start for the salvation of the human race from nuclear extinction. But it is by no means the end of the endeavor. All we that the majority of the world have done is show that we will have nothing to do with humanity's extinction. That we have done all we can to prevent it. All we who have forsworn nuclear weapons to settle arguments. Leaving it entirely to the better angels of their nature for the remaining nuclear armed states and the P-5 to finish the work we begun. We do not promise peace. But we did our best to ensure you night of nuclear winter. Thank you. We thank you, uh, Secretary Loxin. And now we proceed with our first resource speaker. He served as uh, the permanent representative of the Philippines to the United Nations in New York from 2010 to 2015. And as mentioned by the secretary, served as the president of the 2010 NPT Review Conference. It was during his presidency that the NPT outcome document, which contains the 64 point action plan was adopted and the humanitarian dimension of disarmament was given much emphasis. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Libran Kabaktulan. Colleagues, <clears throat> friends, in a statement to the United Nations in 2019, the Philippines hailed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or TPNW, as a landmark agreement that fortifies the nuclear disarmament architecture and delegitimizes once and for all the use of nuclear weapons. There is a direct nexus between TPNW and the International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. My remarks today, among others, will make that point clear. You see, as part of an international law, 
IHL is a body of rules governing relations between states and among themselves. And the core objective of this really is the protection, security of civilians, the non-combatants. A major part of international humanitarian law is contained in the four Geneva Convention of 1949 and other agreements, and I will name this. One, the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict. Second, the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention. Third, the 1980 Conventional Weapons Convention. Fourth, the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention. Fifth, the 1997 Ottawa Convention on Anti-Personal Mines, and six, the 2000 Optional Protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflict. Friends, as you may notice very quickly, there is something gribbly missing in this list, and that is on nuclear weapons. The International Committee on the Red Cross, or ICHR, have had several initiatives before 2010 Review Conference of NPT, designed to heighten global awareness of the importance of IHL. And IHL has been referred in various statements of delegation before the UN, before the NPT, and other forums. Happily, and finally, in the consensus outcome of the 2010 review conference, IHL has found its way in a major document. The final document of 2010 review conference expresses deep concern at the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and reaffirms the need for all states at all times to comply with applicable international law, including international humanitarian law. The negotiations were very complex, very engaged. All major points or issues were interrelated or interconnected. The maximum position was first to target, I would say, from the NNWS, the non-nuclear weapon states, to target a time frame or a schedule for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. While the negotiations were going on, it became clear to me the impossibility of having a consensus on a definite time timetable. And so the strategy was to load the outcome document with points of possible agreements that would advance the direction toward total nuclear elimination. References to IHL, even the relevance of the Convention of Nuclear Arms and concrete arms to action towards nuclear disarmaments were covered in the 64 points action plan. But the most critical really is that for the first time, this document, consensus outcome, a world free of nuclear weapon was articulated as the goal of nuclear disarmament. Nuclear weapon states also committed themselves to continuing to work together to accelerate concrete progress towards dis disarmament. At the 2010 NPT conference and under the initiative of AFTER, and under the initiative of certain countries, notably Norway, Mexico, and Austria, the headway achieved was pursued. There were three, three humanitarian uh, conferences on humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons in Oslo, in Mexico, and in Vienna. Yet, you might, it might be observed that there was no clear direction as to where it should be carried to its final destination or its logical conclusion. 
But you see a core group of countries or core group of, yes, countries tilted the balance and galvanized the approach to a treaty banning nuclear weapons. The Philippines was involved in all those IHL conferences after 2010 NPT Review Conference. It also had its engagement with countries and various groups to advance IHL. At the American Bar Association on 20 April 2010, with Dr. John Barrow as the, the executive director, the Philippines made it clear its position on IHL. Nuclear weapons There may be a need to lean on other imperatives that would compel countries to be within defense of TPNW and be on the side of humanity survival. We may have to summon the higher or spiritual help for enlightenment. The Philippine mission therefore engages a very fruitful discussion with various interreligious groups, including the Holy See. And we highlight really the three pillars that I personally consider key to moving forward, the legal, the humanitarian, and the moral. It wasn't exceedingly clear that the United, at, uh, that the United, General, United Nations General Assembly give its nod for the negotiation on TPNW. By Resolution 71 stroke 258, the General Assembly decided to convene in 2017 a United Nations conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. Look at the voting screen. Only 119 voted in favor it would it was really a difficult road to move ahead i can only admire and pay tribute to the countries and individuals who persisted and invested time efforts and resources to make the tpnw a reality in its forthcoming meeting we can expect that it will devote its time to housekeeping and other administrative arrangements. But I believe that it should already start to venture into specific ways and means to advance the full realization of the treaty. The road ahead may be bumpy and will certainly take some time. I would like to think that emphasis on the following points should be accorded. A plan of action to encourage more countries to ratify or accede to the treaty. A plan of action to expand worldwide appreciation of the treaty. And initial ideas to follow certain direction in the United Nations organs and bodies, as well as in the NTP forums itself. More countries, particularly middle power countries, should accede to the treaty. We need more ratification of the treaty as we solidify the standing of TPNW as a source of international law. The role of NGOs and other global groups are extremely pivotal in encouraging more countries to accept the treaty. The key is really to mobilize global public opinion. Some thoughts should already be explored that would carry the treaty to its ultimate acceptance by all. The session halls of the UN, the NPT forums itself, major other organs of the UN may be subjected to an approach which is purposive and yet accommodating or carried in a positive or friendly atmosphere. NPT Article 6, Part 2, or the last phrase thereof, speaks of 
strict and effective international control may have to be taken into account in the strategy that could be developed. But I wish to caution that all efforts should be exerted to ensure a positive or friendly atmosphere in seeking mutual understanding and cooperation. We are in one planet. We all perish if that planet is destroyed. But we have to be very aware now that there is a great divide. On one hand, those favoring or already in the TPNW, and on the other, those outside defense, so to speak. I leave you with those pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for a very comprehensive discussion of what transpired during the presidency, your presidency of the 2010 NPT Revcon. Our next speaker is the right-hand man of Ambassador Kabaktulan during the, the Revcon. He also served as first committee expert in the Philippine mission to the UN in New York. To discuss state party obligations, in the TPNW and some insights on the negotiation of this treaty, may I introduce Director Rafael Hermoso. Pleasant morning to you all. Sorry, I cannot, apologies, I cannot be there personally to, to, or online with you now as uh, and that this is a pre-recorded message due to other obligations. But I am pleased to speak with you on the topic state party obligations, commitments as envisioned by the framers of the Treaty Prohibiting Nuclear Weapons, or as I'll refer to it from now on, uh, TPNW just for ease of para uh, lang so it'll be faster. So Ambassador Kabaktulan has already spoken to you on the 2010 NPT Review Conference, NPT Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT Review Conference, and the emergence of the concept of the humanitarian impact of, new, of the use of nuclear weapons. My job, as I see it, is to bridge the gap between the humanitarian impact issue, the NPT, and the TPNW. But before I get into the subject matter, allow me to offer praise to a top diplomat and negotiator. I haven't seen Ambassador Kamakula in, in quite some time, but would just like to say for the record what a remarkable job he did in 2010, in what is to date the most successful NPT review conference in its over 50-year history. It's 51 years old now, with a 64-point action plan. And as he would always point out, the decision on the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. It was a privilege to watch you work, sir. Your reputation as a top negotiator and diplomat is very well deserved, and this was on full display in 2010. So I thank you, sir, for the opportunity to work with you, and more importantly, for the mentorship and the guidance. Now on to the top actual topic at hand, which is um, state party obligations commitments as envisioned by framers of the TPNW. So, um, if you read the preambular portion of the of the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons, you will see the importance this places on the humanitarian and its emphasis on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. All you have to do is look at the second preambular paragraph. The first preambular is, of course, you always start with the UN Charter above everything else, respect for the Charter. But then second preambular, you immediately see language regarding the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, which shows you the which shows you the reason for being of this treaty. And uh, if I could say something briefly on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, although the incident in Japan, I think in 2011, 
anyway, the Fukushima nuclear accident, although that did not involve nuclear weapons and it was a uh, civilian in nature, a developed country with all the technology and resources had difficulty responding to that event. Now imagine the detonation of a nuclear weapon. And the nuclear weapons now, their yield is significantly stronger than those unleashed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I think it is clear that, um, that no country is capable of fully responding to such an event. And other, other items that are discussed in the preambular portion, it goes uh, to show you the other concerns, which is um, international humanitarian law, the slow pace of nuclear disarmament, the existence of the obligation to pursue nuclear disarmament obligations, which is under the NPT, uh, the acknowledgement of the NPT as the cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Just to, to highlight the relationship of the of the TPNW with the NPT, and then the acknowledgement of the comprehensive test ban treaty, nuclear weapon-free zones, and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So these are all acknowledged in the in the uh, in the preambular portion. Okay, moving on to actual obligations and, and things we have to follow. So Article One is on prohibitions, obviously things that you cannot do. And these are the things that are not allowed by the treaty. For the Philippines, it is only natural for us to comply with this article and the treaty in general because of our constitution, specifically Section 8 under state policies. And I quote, the Philippines consistent with the national interest adopts and pursues a policy of freedom from nuclear weapons in its territory. We will not develop, acquire, produce. These are just some of the uh, the the, the, uh, the, the, pro the things that we cannot do. So, uh, and we also can't receive nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. Going on to Article One, Section G, which I think is the most important section under this article, and uh, this is where it is where our constitution comes in. I see this as being in line with our constitution in that we cannot allow any stationing, installation, or deployment of nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices in our territory or at any place under our jurisdiction or control. So compliance with the constitution and we meet this um, article. Article 2 on declarations. This is the requirement on declaring any nuclear weapons activities or the presence of nuclear weapons. The Philippines, again, should be able to comply with this provision and make a declaration that we never own, possess, or control nuclear weapons or nuclear explosive devices or had a nuclear weapons program. However, 1C in this article states, not, uh, notwithstanding Article 1G, declare whether there are any nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices in its territory or in any place under its jurisdiction or control that are owned, possessed, or controlled by another state. This is where there might be some, some issue or some complication because here we get into the issue of a, of a nuclear weapon state or nuclear weapon states deploying nuclear weapons in areas within our jurisdiction. I understand in, in discussions with Emilio that a declaration specifically addressing this issue is being prepared and is in the process of being finalized. So that should um, address the matter of nuclear weapons being deployed in areas in our jurisdiction without knowledge by a nuclear weapon state. In terms of safeguards, Article 3, this is about making sure that once you give up your nuclear weapons, you do not attempt to get them back or develop them again, hence the importance of the section. It is also about verification, about trust. Having these safeguards will ensure that all countries uh, are aware of what our activities are in terms of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons production. So in, in my personal opinion, this was the most crucial article in the negotiations in New York in 2017. And if ever there were going to be differences among the mostly like-minded countries that participated in the negotiations, this was going to be at the heart of any disagreement among them. And this article is also at the center of the criticisms of some of the nuclear weapon states against the TPNW. Just as a background, the countries that participated in 2017 were all non-nuclear 
weapon states. None of the nuclear weapon states or states with nuclear weapons were present. And because of that, negotiations were more or less cordial and not intractable. But the issue of safeguards and verification has always been difficult, even among the non-nuclear weapon states. Some of the nuclear weapon states now actually juxtapose this article with the 2010 NPT Action Plan, specifically Action 28, and I quote Action 28 of the NPT Action Plan of 2010. The conference encourages all states parties which have not done so to conclude and to bring into force additional, additional, this is the important part, additional protocols as soon as possible and to implement them provisionally pending their entry into force. In the TPNW, the safeguard section, sections one and two, deal with the IAEA and its comprehensive safeguards agreement, but the TPNW fails to make specific mention of the IAEA additional protocol. You can argue that the AP or the additional protocol is alluded to with language in section two, each state, and I quote, each state party shall thereafter maintain such obligations without prejudice to any additional relevant instruments that it may adopt in the future. The fact that the AP is missing is an issue for the nuclear weapon states. And, and they say that the, because of this, the TPNW undermines or weakens the NPT and that it reverses progress on verification in 2010. Uh, basically, some of the nuclear weapon states feel that it is a step back. Now, just to give you some background on the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, IAEA Safeguards Agreement and Additional Protocol. For this, we have to go back to Gulf War One, Iraq, Gulf War One, and the DPR, and, uh, and also to the DPRK. This, they, they discovered, the UN inspectors discovered undeclared nuclear programs were going on in these countries. Um, and so because of these undeclared nuclear programs, because the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement only deals with declared, so they developed an additional protocol to be able to see every, uh, every aspect of a country's nuclear program. So it is a, you could argue, a more, it grants more access, the additional protocol grants more access to the IAEA to review everything that a country does in terms of its, its nuclear program. It, in fact, it is often referred to as the gold standard in verification, okay? And therefore necessary to determine whether a country's nuclear program is purely for peaceful purposes. Now, why wasn't the AP specifically included in the safeguard section of the TPNW and in this section on, on safeguards? I recall that one delegation strongly opposed it, and, and I guess the next question is why would that country oppose it? And I can only surmise at this point that this had something to do with the Middle East, something to do with the Middle East and Middle East politics. In the NPT process, proponents of verification tell countries in the Middle East, or proponents of the additional protocol tell countries in the Middle East that they should all have a comprehensive safeguard agreement and an additional protocol. And yet the countries in the Middle East argue, well, there is a country here that is known to have weapons, nuclear weapons, and yet it's not being forced to have an AP. So that's the back and forth there. So that may have something to do with it, something to do with the opposition. And yet this country that opposed it in the negotiations in New York in 2017 agreed to the language in the 2010 NPT review conference on, on additional protocol. So this is one of those things that, uh, anyway, uh, perplexing. They agreed to it in 2010 in, in, in the NPT review conference process, but yet couldn't agree to it in the, in the TPNW. But anyway, going to the Philippine obligations, on this section, the Philippines can easily comply because we have a safeguards agreement with the IAEA, and even though the AP is not mentioned in the treaty, in the safeguards uh, section, we also have a additional protocol. We have concluded an additional protocol with the, with the IAEA. So for us, it's a matter of meeting our CSA, Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, and our additional protocol. So our Philippine Nuclear Research Institute, the USD, just now, they have to work with the, uh, the, the IAEA. On Article 4, and this is towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons, Section 1, and if you read it, for me, I, I call this the South African model because um, this is uh, before South Africa joined 
the NPT, it had a nuclear weapons program, and yet it dismantled it and joined the NPT. This section uh, and this um, section four, sorry, Article Four, Section One, pretty much gives you the process on how a country that possessed nuclear weapons can divest itself and then join the treaty. Okay, so, and really this section is more, this entire article is more for countries that currently possess nuclear weapons and uh, will hopefully join the treaty in the future. This article provides the how on how countries can disarm themselves and then the requirements, and the safeguards, obligations, etc. Okay. But again, this may relate to the Philippines given that each state party that has nuclear weapons or new other nuclear explosive devices in any place under its jurisdiction or control that are owned, possessed, or controlled by another state shall ensure the prompt removal of such weapons. So uh, again, I think we have a declaration on this and that is being prepared that should address this, this matter. Okay, next, Article 5 is on national implementation. For me, this means uh, coming up with the domestic legislation that will make sure this treaty is enforced. So for our non-nuclear uh, non-proliferation obligations, we already have and our obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Weapons Convention. We have the Strategic Trade Management Act, which controls the trade in dual-use goods. So it's a matter of complying with that. Our obligations under United Nations Security Council 1540 on weapons of mass destruction and reporting regularly to that body and um, and also drafting domestic legislation that would be the implementing legislation for the TPNW. So that is what we need to do. For example, for the Chemical Weapons Convention, there is a pending Senate bill, I think, uh, on an act prohibiting chemical weapons. So we need an act similar to this preventing uh, or prohibiting nuclear weapons. Okay, six and seven, I'll take them together in the interest of time. And just to highlight article six and seven on victim assistance and international cooperation. I would like to highlight the, the role of um, one of our top ambassadors and diplomats, Ambassador Zenaid Angara Collins, and who's part of the delegation. She led negotiations on this topic to ensure that there was strong language on international cooperation and victim assistance. Ambassador Collinson worked with the small island developing states that had been affected by nuclear weapons testing to ensure some of the language be, would be reflected here. So if, you know, Phil Dell made a contribution to the whole treaty, but um, where we really took a lead role was on this the issue done with, but, and yet Ambassador Collinson did not back down, so she raised it from the floor in, in plenary, in one of the plenary sessions in the and uh, pushed for stronger language on this. So in terms of our obligations, obviously we should assist those that have been, that have been affected by nuclear weapons testing, specifically um, countries in the small island, developing states in the Pacific. Article 8 is on the meeting of states parties. As for the obligation here, we should participate actively in the, in the process, especially in the early going, in the, next, in the first meeting of states parties in Vienna, we get to dictate and set the agenda, the priorities of this body, how this treaty would be implemented, and how future MSPs and RefCons will be carried out. So it's good to be part of the process from the beginning as we lay the groundwork and we, we build up this edifice of the treaty privately with the weapons. So that would be our obligation. Costs, obviously we have to pay our contributions. So you, you NEO, I, the International Commitments Fund, this is another one of those treaties that we have to share the costs with other countries. Articles 10, 11, I think, are self-explanatory amendments and settlement of disputes. 12 is on universality. It is our job as a state party to encourage others to join, especially those in our region. There's the same similar process in the ATT where we encourage other countries to join, although we haven't, I think we haven't ratified the ATT, so there's that um, campaign to get as many countries on board. Obviously, it would be important and nice to have uh, nuclear weapon states as part of this, so we should campaign and, and uh, try to get, um, and I'll discuss that later towards the end, uh, but it's important to, to make this treaty universal. So 13, 14, signature ratification, I think that's self-explanatory. 15, Article 15 is entry into force. 
and just to juxtapose this with the CTBT, CTBT used a qualitative method, whereas the TPNW, like the ATT, used a quantitative method, wherein a certain number of countries ratifying and then enter into force. So I think the disarmament negotiators learned their lesson from the CTBT. So Article 16, reservations, treaty doesn't allow this, duration and withdrawal. Um, comparing this to the N with the NPT, um, the TPNW was for an indefinite, um, it's indefinite. Whereas in the NPT, in its early going, it was supposed to end in 1995. That's why you have the review and extension conference extending the treaty indefinitely. So, just as a difference. Okay, uh, and then Article 18 is on the relationship with other agreements, which I think is important because of the relationship with the, uh, the NPT. So in terms of our obligations in this treaty, just to summarize, First, number one, we need to abide by and adhere to our own constitution and enforce the prohibition on the presence of nuclear weapons in our territory, draft implementing legislation through this treaty, similar to what is being done for the Chemical Weapons Convention, and for this we need to find a champion in the Senate, update ex existing legislation if needed on export, sorry, export control regimes to factor in the TPNW such as the Strategic Trade Management Act, our DOST, PNRI, and other related agencies to work with the IAEA in terms of our obligations under the safeguards section of the treaty, specifically on the CSA and the AP. Implement and comply with our international obligations, specifically UNSCR 1540 on WMD. Submit our regular reports to this body. Meet our NPT obligations and our obligations under the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials. Finally ratify, and we haven't done this, I think we need to do this, ratify the 2005 amendment of the Convention on the Physical Protection on Nuclear Materials. We need to be active in the meeting of states parties in the future REFCON. As I said, the Philippine delegation can help build on this treaty and how it carries its work procedurally, which could just be as important as whatever substantive outcomes result in the meeting of states parties or the REFCON. To make sure this treaty is implemented in all areas under our jurisdiction, including the WPS, I think we need to get the nuclear weapon states, all nuclear weapon states, to accede to the protocol of Shantes, or the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone. All five. Um, this way, we have a commitment from the P5 to respect our region and maritime zones, which should be free of nuclear weapons. I understand that from before, China has stated its willingness, and I think among the P5 it is the most willing, to work with ASEAN on uh, uh, the additional protocol of the uh, of the Bangkok Treaty or the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty. And they are receptive, and if memory serves, they are even willing to succeed without uh, reservations. But of course, I, I, I can be correct about this. So, but that's something we can do. Um, this year also marks the 30th anniversary of ASEAN-China Dialogue Relations, and China is keen on marking the occasion and becoming a comprehensive strategic partner of ASEAN. What, what better way to do this than by China acceding to the protocol of China? China can be the first nuclear weapons state to do this, which would give credence to its no first use policy in that its weapons are purely for defensive purposes. So beyond Philippine obligations, the question should be asked, and I, I, I won't be there for the question and answer, but this question should be asked, and, and you should be thinking about this. What is the value of a treaty that prohibits weapons that none of the current states and parties actually possess? In comparison, let's say, to the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention, wherein the states and parties actually possess or possess biological and chemical weapons. So what is the value of a treaty that prohibits something that none of the current states and parties possess? Because as I said at the outset, none of the countries that participated in the conference had nuclear weapons. It was basically a conference of almost all like-minded countries. Uh, so what is its value, in other words? The answer, in my view, this is a personal opinion, is that the TPNW fills a gap. With the NPT, there is a clear nuclear disarmament obligation among the nuclear weapon states, but it does not provide or specify the method on how to do it. Whereas the TPNW provides the answer to this question, on the question of how to go about nuclear disarmament. And this is clearly answered by Article 4, 
of the TPNW towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons. So the TPNW fills this void and gap. So I say the, the TPNW complements the NPT and supports it rather than undermines it. And I am hopeful that the nuclear weapon states and the states with nuclear weapons will join the TPNW and follow its articles in terms of how to divest themselves of their nuclear weapons and the, and the necessary, i.e. EA verification regi regime. So basically, Articles 3 and 4. In closing, and to answer my own question on the efficacy of the TPNW, it is a useful treaty in that it lays the groundwork for the future. It sets the rules, the means, and the method for when these possessor states are ready to finally give up their weapons. And it fills the biggest gap in terms of treaties on, on weapons of mass destruction in that it, it, there is finally a treaty prohibiting the most deadly weapon ever invented. One, if used again, could cause untold human suffering and would have a clear humanitarian impact that no country would be able to overcome. I thank you for giving me the floor and sorry that took long. Thank you, Director Hermoso. So uh, from his presentation, uh, a draft uh, legislation similar to the CWC bill, as well as continued engagement with the P5 to sign the protocol of the Sean Fez are just some of the next steps for the Philippines as a state party to the TPNW. Our next speaker is uh, the Vice President for Academic Affairs of Miriam College and an associate at the Center for Peace Education. Through her work in the center, she supports the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And uh, this morning to share with us insights on civil society participation in the ratification of the TPNW with us is Dr. Hasmin Nario Galase. Thank you very much, uh, Marge. Um, Ambassador Kamakulan, um, DFA officers, and all participants in this call, good morning. Can you see my presentation now? Thank you very much. I will speak about the participation of civil society in the Philippines towards the ratification of the TPNW. So as mentioned by Marge, my name is Hasmin Ario Galase, and I'm presenting um, on behalf of Dr. Loretta Castro, Executive Director of the Center for Peace Education. Next slide, please. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the Center for Peace Education's um, active participation towards the ratification of the treaty is inspired um, by the leadership of ICANN, the international campaign um, to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, we were invited by ICANN to be a partner organization in the Philippines in 2013. Uh, when Tim Wright, who is in this call, came to the office um, to make a proposal, we gave him a huge yes even in the absence of a diamond ring, <laughs> because um, CPE has been a proponent of this armament since its birth in 1997. And um, CPE's strong advocacy for this armament since its birth is due to its strong belief that the increasing global spending for weapons is a misallocation of scarce resources that could better be used for people's basic needs. Um, it has been established that deprivation of the right um, to basic needs um, is the root of violent conflict. CP is also deeply concerned about the lethality of weapons, especially the weapons of mass destruction that cause unspeakable human suffering. Next slide, please. If we can, thank you very much. So CP made two major commitments to this campaign. Number one is to help increase public awareness and encourage action of relevant parties towards supporting a nuclear ban treaty. And the second um, is to work with the Department of Foreign Affairs towards a nuclear ban treaty. There was no doubt in our mind that the DFA had a supportive stance from the very, very beginning. And we are grateful and happy um, that the Philippine Constitution actually mandates that the country adopts and pursues a policy of freedom from nuclear weapons in its territory the Philippines is a state party to the 1995 um, Treaty of Bangkok, which established Southeast Asia as a nuclear weapons-free zone. 
and that the Philippine mission to the UN had always delivered strong messages supporting nuclear disarmament, including in the 2010 anti-TRAFCON, where Ambassador um, Kabaktulan served as conference president. Next slide, please. Well, on um, with our story. So in December 2014, um, the Center for Peace Education, upon the invitation of ICANN, attended the Vienna Conference that gave birth to the Humanitarian Pledge. And the generation of the Humanitarian Pledge became a compelling and rallying point for civil society. Endorsed by 125 states, the pledge laid the groundwork for treaty negotiations. The story of civil society participation in the Philippines was not only a story of the Center for Peace Education, Throughout, we worked with other civil society organizations in the country, such as the Medical Action Group and the International Physicians um, for the Prevention of Nuclear War Philippine Chapter, the Nuclear Free Philippines Coalition, the UN Interfaith Harmony Partners Manila, Sohagaka International Philippines, Pax Christi Filipinas, Philippine Council for Peace and Global Education, the Peace Education Network, and student clubs um, such as the Pax Christi Miriam College. Next slide, please. So uh, what were some of the things we did to raise the awareness on the importance of a treaty banning nuclear weapons? So, um, you know, from CP's birth, we have been commemorating um, the Hiroshima um, Nagasaki um, bombing um, through exhibits, you know, talks um, and, and, and other activities. Um, we have held many forums, but our first public forum on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, um, you know, um, was held um, soon after, you know, uh, we have been involved, um, particularly, um, specifically on um, the campaign to ban nuclear weapons um, through a treaty. So uh, we um, sponsored, uh, we co-organized this forum um, with DFA, um, the IPPNW, the Green Convergence, um, and um, other organizations. And as I've mentioned, we have held many forums um, on this um, issue. Um, every year, uh, we um, uh, actually organize a Nuclear Abolition Day that's um, on September 26th. We have held concerts, uh, you know, have um, held talks on this, um, have put up Freedom Wall, among other activities. And uh, we have circulated, you know, appeals, um, such as a global parliamentary appeal for a nuclear weapons ban, and also we have circulated petitions, drafted statements of support for the treaty, circulated infographics, held with our parties, even visited the bank in the Philippines investing on nuclear weapons, staged many public actions, including a march against the bomb. Sorry that, you know, we failed to include those photos here. Next slide, please. So, um, if we can go to the next slide. It's probably lagging. Okay, believing that um, to, to reach peace, we teach, we teach it. We have given many disarmament education workshops and talks to teachers, students, and other sectors. So um, we also um, included the issue whenever the CPE gave talks at conferences and in other schools throughout the country. We have submitted articles in major dailies, noting the strong statements of our Philippines Department of Foreign Affairs. We also did radio and TV guestings to explain to the public the importance of the treaty. Next slide, please. And throughout, we engage um, the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs because we recognize DFA's strong and principled position in the UN treaty negotiations, which was, which was put to a vote on July 7, 2017. We recognize DFA's subsequent actions, which was among the first 50 to sign the treaty in September 2017. Our DFA supported the ratification by transmitting the treaty file to the Office of the President in a very timely manner. So we are very grateful for that. Next slide, please. We also actively engaged the Senate in general and the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations in particular. We prepared position papers and statements. We walked down the halls of the Senate many times, visiting senators' offices, handing statements, appealing our cause. You know, so um, we diligently followed up the office of the president, nagged every person we knew there to ask for updates on the TPNW status. And we recall with joy the speech made by the president of the UN General Assembly that was reiterated by DFA Secretary Teddy Doxin 
and we jumped up and down when we received the news that on November 18, the OP transmitted the treaty file to the SCFR. So again, we mobilized our networks um, to um, write letters to all the senators, um, also use their um, Facebook and Twitter accounts to post you know, our appeals, you know, um, our ask. Okay, so um, on January 22, 2021, we held you know, a Twitter party, um, EIF Twitter party, and um, uh, perhaps some of you are asking what the Twitter party is. You know, we actually like um, dedicate an hour, um, usually at 8 p.m., you know, which is a prime time. Um, and we ask um, people um, to, um, to go on, um, on Twitter at the time. And then we develop, we have a hashtag, you know, and then, you know, um, just, send mess and, and just send messages to the senators, you know, um, about um, the matters and then about the matter. And, you know, um, we get to um, actually um, check if people have actually posted messages um, through our hashtag. So, um, so we were very happy that on February 1, um, the, the Senate unanimously ratified the treaty. And on February 18, um, the instrument was just deposited. So, um, the, so we are very, very thankful, um, Philippines, um, and congratulations for doing that. Next slide, please. So um, in closing, and as a representative of civil society, we wish to express gratitude to the government and say that we stand ready to support the Philippines towards the fulfillment of its um, obligations as a state party. You know, it is um, our common cause. Um, there were people in the DFA who specifically engaged. Many of you are in this call. You know who you are. We are very, very thankful and congratulate you for this. During the diplomatic negotiations at the UN, we recall Ambassador Elaine White Thomas, president of the conference, saying that the treaty responds to the hopes and dreams of the present and future generations. ICANN, the Philippines, and civil society in the Philippines, we did it. We have helped respond to this hope, and we in civil society will continue to help fulfill the dream of living in a world free of nuclear weapons. Marami pong salamat. Thank you, Dr. Galase. Our next speaker is the head of the legal department of ICRC Philippines. She is a solicitor of the Supreme Court of Queensland and the High Court of Australia and holds a postgraduate degree in international law from the Australian National University. From ICRC, let us welcome Ms. Georgia Hines. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Teodoro Loxon Jr., Excellencies Kabakchulan and Manolo, Deputy Assistant Secretary Manolo, distinguished fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I'd really like to thank DFA UNIO uh, for inviting the International Committee of the Red Cross to contribute today, but even more so for holding this event. I think it's a wonderful initiative and it's not one that we often see being driven by governments themselves. So uh, I think it's very important that we take time to celebrate these achievements and also to reflect on how we got here. So I'm pleased that we've had people who uh, in this call have been here from the beginning and are able to provide their experiences. And this really is such a significant achievement. Uh, the Philippines now stands among the states that have led this historic entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I think it might have seemed unrealistic in the past, and yet together, here we are, we made it a reality. So indeed, it's a victory for humanity, and it was made possible by the unrelenting efforts of states and their advisors and officials, uh, and again, I know many of you were on the call, um, but also by international organizations, civil society actors, and on behalf of the ICRC, I warmly congratulate you all for bringing us here. But of course, whilst we quite rightly celebrate the entry into force of the TPNW for the Philippines, we can't forget that prohibiting nuclear weapons is the beginning, not the end of our efforts. There are still today more than 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Many thousands of these are on high alert, ready to be launched at a moment's notice. So this is the reality that we're up against. Now, recognizing this reality and the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, the TPNW is the first international instrument to mitigate these by requiring all states that have suffered a nuclear explosion 
to provide medical care, for instance, for victims on their territory. And just as importantly, and I think some of my fellow speakers have identified this, the treaty also articulates the end state. So it gives us for the first time a benchmark against which all efforts towards nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, uh, towards which those will be judged. What it doesn't do, of course, is magically eliminate the world's current nuclear arsenal. And it would be naive to expect any treaty in and of itself to deliver a world without nuclear weapons tomorrow. So I think we need to be realistic and the treaty should instead be viewed as the moral and the legal starting point for a long-term effort to achieve nuclear disarmament. We now have to work to ensure that there is the broadest possible adherence to the treaty's prohibitions. And to do this, uh, we need to work both through national implementation and through international diplomacy efforts. So turning to the first of those two prongs, national implementation. As the Deputy Assistant Secretary noted, this first step for the Philippines, now that the treaty is entered into force, is to submit a declaration to the UN Secretary General within 30 days. And that's in line with Article 2 of the treaty. And I know our wonderful legal advisor at ICRC, attorney J.M. Sison, has been in touch with officers in UNIO to offer our support. And we do have template documents that can be used for this purpose. But really for the Philippines, this declaration will be quite straightforward. It's mainly just ticking no as responses for questions such as whether the country has or previously had nuclear weapons. So it should be a, a bit of an easy uh, win, so to speak. The next step uh, in line with Article 5 will be about taking all necessary measures to implement the obligations. And the language of the treaty, and we've already heard about this um, from Director Hermosa in particular, includes adopting legal, administrative, other measures. That includes penal or criminal sanctions. So we'll have individual criminal offences. Um, and it's about preventing and suppressing violations committed by anyone or on territory under Philippines jurisdiction or control. Now, as we've already heard, you already have some very robust constitutional and legislative protections. And Director Hermosa has eloquently outlined the constitutional prohibitions, which are a really excellent starting point. You also have the recent uh, 2020 Anti-Terrorism Act, which prohibits the development, manufacture, possession, acquisition, transport, supply, or use of nuclear weapons. So this definitely will go some way towards meeting the Article 1 uh, TPNW strong prohibitions. You also have things like Executive Order 65 of 2018, and that's a negative foreign investment list. So it was about prohibiting foreign or domestic investment in manufacture, repair, stockpiling, distribution of nuclear weapons. And so with this, we're aligning it with the TPNW's ban against assisting anyone from engaging in any prohibited activity, which is a unique feature of the, the TPNW. Republic Act 10697, which is the Strategic Goods Act, uh, creates a regulative framework for trade in what it calls strategic goods, but it covers goods that are used for the production of nuclear weapons. So again, a really good basis to build from and then to add those additional measures that are required by the TPNW. And I would again like to really extend a standing offer of assistance on behalf of my team. We're always happy to help where we can in things like assessing these additional um, gaps and, and addressing them where necessary. It's really where the ICRC's legal advisory service excels. We have things like model laws that are drafted specifically for those purposes. So I think that's national implementation, but the point to make is that it's especially important, I think, for this particular instrument, because it will have an effect not only in the Philippines, but other states will look to the leading practice of the Philippines on this treaty when they move to take action. So you become a precedent setter for this kind of thing. And then moving on to the second prong, I think this domestic process, and we've heard a lot about this already, really needs to go hand in hand with regional and with international diplomacy. 
In particular, we have this opportunity uh, with the first meeting of states parties to the treaty, which will take place in January next year, and which has already been discussed by, I think, all of my uh, fellow distinguished speakers. So this first meeting in any treaty's history, it's an important milestone. And I think the TPNW is no exception. It will be a really key opportunity to send a strong signal that the TPNW is a credible and viable instrument, that it has concrete obligations and that it has real and it's not only symbolic value. There are actual obligations that need to be implemented as we've seen. So in the ICRC's view, this first meeting of states parties or MSP, it should really be focusing on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, which is at the core of the treaty uh, and has been right from the beginning. And it should be focusing on the rationale for nuclear disarmament more broadly. So coming back to those humanitarian consequences. We're also urging states around the world for this meeting to address concrete steps that parties can take towards universalization. So that might be something like a political declaration. Um, and then we also want them to address the concrete steps for effective implementation. So here, I'm also talking about the positive obligations about victim assistance, environmental remediation, uh, and also international cooperation and assistance. We need a bit of a, a roadmap, or I think it's been called a plan of action um, today for that. The MSP will also adopt the rules of procedure that will be applied for meetings going forward. So here we'd really call on states to ensure that the rules provide for meaningful participation from civil society, international organizations, and of course, for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement that the ICRC is a part of. So we encourage the Philippines to continue to play an active role in the lead up for this first MSP. And I was very pleased to hear these similar remarks um, emphasized by Director Hermosa in New York. And that includes working to shape the agenda, which we think should be substantial, but also not overly ambitious. We should not be setting ourselves up for failure at this early stage. So we're also, uh, in terms of other efforts on diplomacy, the ICRC is working to encourage states, um, even if they are only signatories, not yet parties, and even if they're not even signatories, we're really wanting them to attend the MSP as observers so that they can get a sense of what the treaty is about and what can be done. So we'd really want the Philippines to be offering that same encouragement to its diplomatic partners in the region and more broadly, basically saying, come along uh, and just sit in initially. Lastly, we do think the MSP should address this big question about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty or the NPT. And here, it should be really reinforcing the point that the TPNW, it doesn't replace, it doesn't undermine the NPT. Instead, as been, has been said today, it complements it. We really see the TPNW as a realization of the existing obligation in Article 6 of the NPT, which was agreed by all nuclear weapon states. And in that Article uh, 6, States committed to pursuing negotiations in good faith on nuclear disarmament and specifically on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. So surely this is exactly what's been achieved through the TPNW. Uh, in fact, I, I think the TPNW then was really envisaged by states when they adopted the NPT, including all the nuclear weapon states. So then in closing, I'd like to once again thank the DFA UNIO team for this wonderful event today and for all their efforts to date to get us to this point. And to congratulate the Philippines again for being on the right side of history with its ratification of this treaty. From a personal perspective, it's very nice to be amongst people today who I don't need to convince about the devastating impacts of, of nuclear weapons, which we all know transcend national borders, they pose grave consequences to human survival, the environment, socioeconomic development, the global economy, food security, the health of current and future generations. That's obviously a very bleak and tragic picture. But I think days like today, they do give me hope. 
For me, they give me hope that we can actually achieve a future free from the threat of nuclear weapons, which I think will be a safer world for all of us. So thank you all, Maramin Salamatko, and I hand back to Director Marge, thank you. Maramin Salamat, Attorney Hines. And last but not the least, we have the treaty coordinator and one of the founders of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. At this juncture, allow me to give the virtual floor to Mr. Tim Wright of ICANN. Uh well, thank you very much uh, to the Department of Foreign Affairs for including uh, ICANN in this important webinar. We're delighted to be able to celebrate with you this uh, milestone, the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, for the Philippines. And uh, I want to begin by uh, acknowledging the leadership role that the Philippines played during the negotiation uh, of this treaty in 2017, and indeed um, during the uh, in the lead up to the negotiations as well, uh, and I have fond memories of uh, visiting the Philippines in in 2014 for one of the uh, pre preparatory uh, discussions in relation to this, and uh, we had a number of uh, officials present from across. Southeast Asia, and we were discussing you know, what needs to be done to get this idea of a ban on nuclear weapons off the ground. Uh, how can we move forward uh, despite the resistance of the nuclear armed states? Uh, and it's um, nice to be in this position now um, of reflecting on that, um, having you know, achieved the treaty and um, uh, brought the treaty into force globally as well. Um, as Ambassador Kabakchalan um, also mentioned uh, early on in this uh, webinar, um, the humanitarian initiative that gave rise to the negotiations on the TPNW uh, very much has its roots in the outcome document of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 2010, which expressed uh, deep concern about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences uh, of any use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, the Philippines also played um, a key role in initiating this process. Um, so thank you for your uh, country's very principled position on this issue. Um, as a number of speakers have said, it's a, it's a position that is entrenched no less in your uh, constitution. And uh, I want to also acknowledge the very uh, important role of civil society in the Philippines. Um, our main partner organisation, um, as mentioned, is the Centre uh, for Peace Education at Miriam College, uh, which has done uh, a wonderful job, uh, in my opinion, of uh, informing uh, not only their own students, but uh, the wider public about the existence of this treaty and its importance in advancing nuclear disarmament. Um, I've been asked to speak today about the uh, role more generally um, of civil society in promoting the treaty. Um, and a big aspect of our work uh, in the coming years will be on uh, so-called universalization. And under Article 12 of the treaty, it's an obligation, in fact, on states to encourage other states that haven't yet joined the treaty uh, to do so. And uh, currently, there are 54 states parties, um, but you know, many more states uh, are supportive of this treaty. Um, there are 34 that have signed but not yet ratified the treaty, so we're working to uh, encourage those countries to complete their ratification processes. Uh, we have campaigners that are active in many of those states uh, and several um, currently have the uh, treaty before their parliament. So we're expecting further progress uh, in the coming months. Uh, in addition to those uh, 34 signatory states, uh, there are around 50 countries that have in some way 
uh, indicated their support for the treaty but haven't yet signed or ratified it. Um, they've done so by voting in favour of the treaty's adoption in 2017 or by voting in favour of an annual UN General Assembly resolution on the treaty. So all in all, uh, at least um, or close to 140 countries have uh, expressed their support uh, for the treaty in some way. So more than two thirds of the international community. Uh, in Southeast Asia, there's very strong uh, support. Most of the, the countries in the region have signed uh, or ratified the treaty. And I'm going to um, share some images um, just to bear with me for a moment. I have some images of activities uh, in the region. It was a workshop that um, was held in Bangkok among um, Southeast Asian countries. The Philippine was, Philippines was represented at this meeting uh, in 2018 to promote ratification of the treaty. Um, we're hoping that Indonesia will be among the next states to ratify. It's said that it will uh, endeavour to do so by the end of this year. Uh, this is a, a workshop that our campaigners in Indonesia uh, helped organise with the foreign ministry and uh, representatives of the uh, military in Indonesia as well. Um, further afield, um, we have work uh, underway in Nepal. Uh, this was a workshop uh, last year to promote the ratification there. Um, similar initiatives in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, this is a, an event in uh, New Zealand aimed at uh, encouraging more Pacific Island countries to uh, ratify the treaty. Uh, Pacific Island countries um, have in fact been among the uh, fastest to, to become states parties. Uh, 10 of the original 50 states parties uh, were Pacific Island states, but there's more uh, progress to be made there still. Um, a similar forum uh, that took place in Guyana to promote Caribbean um, accession to the treaty. Uh, again, the Caribbean states um, are a significant um, number uh, in terms of the uh, original states parties to the treaty. But I, I think our, our main focus uh, in terms of gathering more ratifications in the short term is on uh, Africa, where 21 states are signatories, uh, but haven't yet ratified. And we have, we have eight ratifications, including from um, Nigeria and South Africa, among others. So many um, activities um, happening there. This is a, a, a forum with West African states, um, an event just a few weeks ago in Burkina Faso, and a press conference in Cameroon. But beyond this um, group of um, supportive states, we're also doing a lot of work in the states that aren't yet supportive of the treaty. And many of these states are members of NATO um, and NATO has adopted a unified position um, of opposition. We're hoping to um, uh, we're persuade, hoping to persuade um, some NATO members to adopt their own national position in support of the treaty. Uh, and there's very strong public support in many NATO countries. This is a demonstration uh, in Norway with about 15,000 people in the streets at the time that we won um, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Um, a number of political parties there have expressed their support, including the party with the greatest number of seats in the current parliament. Uh, and this is the case in many countries across NATO. Uh, it's also the case in Australia, where the Labor Party has uh, expressed its commitment to become a party to the treaty. Uh, so I think that we will... Um, in the coming years, see some of these countries that are currently uh, opponents of the treaty uh, shifting their position based on um, the pressure that they're feeling, firstly, from their own citizens, uh, but secondly, 
from the rest of the international community. And this treaty is going to grow stronger and stronger over time as more and more uh, countries become parties. And that's why it's so important that all of the countries that have already expressed their support um, follow through with ratifying the treaty. Um, this is a, a demonstration in Germany, um, the Green Party there, which uh, is polling well in the uh, opinion polls ahead of the election this September, uh, has expressed its commitment uh, to join the treaty. So there is real uh, potential, even in some of these um, very large NATO states, to, to change position. Um, Germany is one of five states in NATO that host nuclear weapons on their territory. Um, so a change there um, could have very tangible uh, results in terms of um, challenging the continued existence of these weapons. And I think that having any of these NATO states uh, coming on board would put pressure on the nuclear armed members of NATO, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, and France also to uh, conform to this uh, new international norm. Um, we don't expect that in the short term, but that should be our long-term goal. Um, and all of this momentum uh, and pressure is going to lead us there. And of course, if these countries um, take a more um, active interest in the issue um, and show their support, then I think that we can see uh, the support increasing in some of the other nuclear armed states as well. Uh, and we've been reaching out to parliamentarians to ask them to sign our pledge to say that they will work to get their country uh, on board. Uh, more than 2,000 parliamentarians in countries that currently oppose the treaty have signed that pledge. We've also had hundreds of cities, including Berlin, uh, officially express their support for the treaty. Paris is another city that has done so. Uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the local council there has expressed its support and called on the U.S. government uh, to join the treaty, as has Los Angeles and, and several other of the uh, largest cities in the United States. Um, so this is helping to raise public awareness about the treaty and the fact that um, their countries are currently going against the international norm that this treaty has created. Uh, and these are some of the, the politicians in Australia that have, have, have supported the treaty, including the leader of the opposition, Labor Party, um, and a meeting uh, in the United States with a member of Congress who has put forward legislation uh, in support of uh, the United States ratification of the treaty. Uh, even though we don't expect that legislation to uh, be approved in the short term, uh, we see the value in these kinds of initiatives um, simply um, in terms of the attention that they generate uh, for the treaty. So we see um, the treaty very much as a tool that we as civil society organisations around, around the world can use to... Um, start a conversation uh, about the threat of nuclear weapons, um, to get individual politicians to commit to supporting it, to get political parties to support it, uh, to get journalists talking about nuclear disarmament. Um, and I think that until now, um, a lot of the countries that have been um, kind of uh, complicit in this problem, who are, who are allies of the nuclear armed states and who claim to be protected by their nuclear weapons and under a so-called nuclear umbrella. Um, these countries for the first time are really being uh, put in an uncomfortable position and having to um, say whether they uh, support nuclear weapons or not. Uh, and that's the value of this treaty. Um, and I hope that uh, more and more countries will follow the Philippines' lead uh, in becoming parties. When the treaty was adopted in 2017, um, our campaigner, Setsuko Thurlow, who is a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, 
said this is the beginning of the end of nuclear weapons, uh, and I think that's a, a nice way of, of, of framing it. Um, it's a major step forward, um, but it is uh, there's still a, a long road um, ahead of us, and uh, ICANN looks forward to working together with uh, the government of the Philippines and our partner organisations in the Philippines to ensure that this uh, treaty is successful in achieving its goal of a nuclear weapon free world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tim Wright. Indeed, uh, the role of civil society and international organizations is crucial in the ratification of the TPNW, as well as in its effective implementation. And that ends the presentations of our five resource speakers. We will now proceed directly to the Q&A. And uh, my colleague, Ms. Nadine Guevara, will read some of the questions uh, that we received from our attendees uh, during the registration and also from our Q&A chat box. Nadine? Thank you, Ms. Marge. And I would, I would also like to thank our speakers this morning for their insightful presentations. Uh, we're now at the latter part of the program, and that's the Q&A session. So in the interest of time, as what Ms. Marge has said, we've selected questions during the registration uh, and through the the Q&A box this morning. And any of our speakers may answer these questions. Her first question is, would the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the TPNW affect our relations with the United States, particularly the implementation of the Mutual Defense Treaty? Any of our speakers can answer the question. Um, maybe I could start. Um, first and foremost, the TPNW does not really require that uh, a party to the treaty and a non-party must disengage completely its relation because the other party has a nuclear weapon. That is not in the treaty. Secondly, it is not for a member of TPN, uh, TPNW country to dictate what weapons that a non-member country to the TP in W and they two together having some kind of mutual agreement like the Philippines in MDT could dictate what weapons it will use. Third, it is incumbent upon the non other member country of TP in W to exert moral suasion perhaps, what weapons that can be avoided? That is the moral obligation of a member of TPNW. But ultimately, it is a country that is outside of the TPNW will have the sole prerogative to decide to go its way. In summa total or in summary, I do not think at all that it will affect that uh, commitments under the MDT. But we should see this in a larger pic uh, picture. We must see this also in coordinate or in close cooperation in, in relation to the Bangkok Agreement on the Nuclear Free Zone in Asia, in Southeast Asia. Because this is only the only nuclear free zone that do not allow nuclear weapons in 
the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone. This is the only nuclear free zone that included this. I will carry the discussion very far if I will go into this because it requires the accession of NWS. Interestingly, China is the only one that is, has no uh, qualms at all and ready to accede to this protocol. Question why? That is something for us to delve deeply in other forum, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Cabacalan. Our second question is, Article 4 of the TPNW mandates states parties to set a deadline for the destruction of nuclear weapons and or removal of a foreign state's nuclear weapons deployed in another jurisdiction. What is a feasible deadline and how can we ensure that nuclear armed states, if ever they accede to the TPNW, will comply with this deadline? Um, uh, maybe Rafi could um, elaborate on that. But the way I see it, it is really a very critical requirement for countries acceding to the TPNW that this must be complied with because it is simply anathema for any country to be having that. And any new country acceding, if this is lowered down in requirements, it is a discriminatory way of doing it. Why? Because non-nuclear countries, in fact, now acceding, or those having facilities like the Philippines for research, for medical purposes, will have to comply with so many requirements that must be uh, submitted to the TPNW. So this is a very important requirement. And yet, if you have to balance this as well with what is provided really in TPNW, the obligations that are going to be assumed here are no more stringent than those in the NPT. Because you cannot, really, the negotiators were clear enough or you know it too well that it cannot be higher than NPT. It can at most be of equal uh, requirements. However, again, the... There are many things and many ways that uh, a certain direction may be uh, explored. And this is for the TPNW member countries. First meeting, this can be explored and maybe later on. Because I did not, or I failed to refer already, and this was already adverted to or clarified by Tim, I saw already cracks in the ranks of the, uh, I will call it the middle power countries. In what's happening, because I always say that throngs of people of various faith can manifest their desire in the balance, then that would be critical. Because when do we define the century by the middle powers? It is very important, that's why I said more countries should ratify or accede the treaty, particularly the middle powers. We need this to solidify the standing of TPNW in international law in general. It's a long road, but this has to be examined very carefully. The dismantling or hosting rather of those nuclear facilities, because it would be extremely difficult for Germany, for instance, to uh, go ahead. But uh, if the people there will desire more and express in the ballots, that is something else. And therefore, that is very instructive to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Maybe other speakers would also like to answer the question. Um, you go. <laughs> okay, I see we both unmuted at the same time. Um, yeah, I'm happy to add something to that. Um, uh, as um, as I think the um, 
uh, Ms. Hines from the uh, ICRC mentioned there are around 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, and the size of the nuclear arsenals of the uh, nine nuclear armed states vary significantly. Um, so uh, the United States and Russia have several thousand, and it would probably take them longer to eliminate their nuclear weapons than it would uh, for a country with many fewer nuclear weapons. Uh, so the, the deadline that uh, would be set under the treaty at the first meeting of states parties uh, would need to uh, take into account how long uh, it might take for the largest nuclear armed states to disarm. But I wanted to uh, point out that the obligation under the treaty is to eliminate um, the weapons uh, as soon as possible. So even if, um, you're sorry, as soon as possible, but not later than the deadline. Um, so if a country, even if a, if a quite a long deadline um, is set, if a country is dragging its feet, not making any progress, it would be violating its obligation to um, eliminate its weapons as soon as possible. Um, but I also wanted to point out that um, under Article 4, the country is required to remove uh, its weapons from operational status immediately, um, and it's an, under a legal obligation not to use those weapons uh, under Article 1. So taking that step of joining the treaty um, it would be a very significant step, even if the country does take a number of years to um, eliminate its nuclear weapon program. Um, that would be a, a major step forward. Uh, and just to go back to the first question briefly, um, every country is, is free um, to determine its own position on nuclear weapons. Um, adopting a strong stance uh, against nuclear weapons doesn't imply uh, any hostility towards the United States or or others, it's, it just implies opposition to the weapons that these countries uh, possess. And I think it's important for friends to speak up uh, to their friends when they're engaging in dangerous behaviour that's uh, endangering um, their own lives and the lives of others. Uh, we can't remain silent. So, um, uh, Again, congratulations to the Philippines on 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 showing that boldness and and being willing to speak up um, despite the fact that it's not always easy to do so um, given given these um, alliance arrangements that exist. Perhaps I'll I'll just jump in with a couple of additional thoughts. Um, from uh, the second and, and first question, though I think um, His Excellency and I think Tim have covered things quite well. Um, but some things that did occur to me for the for the first question uh, on this idea of military alliances, as the ambassador rightly pointed out, there's nothing that precludes this um, in the treaty, but um, just going to the, there was a question in the chat as well that sort of went to this idea about military exercises. Um, and I mean, there, there is some adjustment required uh, because the treaty would not allow participation uh, in military exercises, which had then uh, nuclear weapons stationed even temporarily in the Philippines. But this doesn't stop other countries that are party to the TPNW from participating in military exercises with, for instance, the US. So, I mean, I know in New Zealand, I used to work in the Pacific and New Zealand definitely participates in many military exercises with the US, but they have certain national caveats, like with many um, aspects of uh, armed forces collaboration um, and and that interoperability. So there are adjustments that need to be made, but this is it, it's not a new thing for militaries to have these overlapping rules of engagement and different ways of managing those relationships. Um, on the second question, I would say, um, yeah, I would echo Tim's points about the fact that it, it basically will vary. It's a sort of case by case about what is going to be feasible for each state to meet 
whatever the deadline is. But I, I think that, um, again, backing up what he is saying, there are many steps along the way that can still be taken and measured uh, before you get to that final end point of elimination. And we are continuing to urge um, nuclear weapon states to, to take these even you know, even prior to committing to join the treaty. So these are things like committing never to use nuclear weapons first or removing those weapons from what's called a, a hair trigger alert status. Um, so there are there are things about pre-notification of military exercises that involve that launch of missiles or other vehicles that are associated with nuclear weapons. So there are concrete steps that can still be taken and that puts them in a better position then to be able to comply when they hopefully do join the treaty down the track. One final thing I would say, because I think an aspect of the second question and some of the other ones I've seen in the chat have focused on, well, how do we, how do we build this pressure um, on what are now opponents to the treaty that possess um, these kinds of arsenals? And I'd like to really highlight here some of the, um, I think, really interesting work that ICANN has done. Uh, sorry, Tim, to steal your thunder, but around divestment. I think it's a really interesting argument that um, things like this treaty in building a norm that supports the idea that nuclear weapons are contrary to international law. This is something that um, actually private sector takes notice of. So you have financial institutions that start adopting clear policies of not investing in this type of technology. And, and I mean, I've drawn on resources that I can put together where they highlight a similar situation with the cost of munitions convention. So even though the US isn't party to that treaty, there was a leading US company, um, Lockheed Martin, that, that said they'd no longer produce these weapons and they'd refuse future orders on the basis that they wanted to continue to be involved or included in investor portfolios, some of which did not support cost of munitions. So I think there's a strong argument that there are more um, kind of innovative ways and, and potentially quite effective ways of exerting that pressure and building not just between states, but between civil society, between private actors, that pressure um, eventually on opponent states. So. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you for answering the first two questions and for addressing some of the comments in our chat box. Um, let's proceed to the third question. Um, third question is, what will be the role of the civil society or international organizations in the upcoming first meeting of states parties to the TPNW? Um, I guess I can say something about that. Um, we very much hope to be physically present, and that's the aim of the Austrian government, to have a, a physical meeting in Vienna in January of next year, um, although the, the format would be a hybrid format in order to allow um, participation for people who um, aren't able to attend physically. Um, the, it's a, it's a three-day conference that's being planned and ICANN would hope to organise um, some kind of public forum uh, in advance of the state conference um, as a way of drawing attention to the issue of nuclear weapons and, and more specifically the efforts to eliminate them through the treaty. Um, and we've done similar conferences before with the three humanitarian focused conferences in 2013 and 2014, um, where we brought together uh, several hundred people to, um, uh, to engage in those discussions and to build our, our movement. Of course, um, these, are, these are more challenging times and no doubt um, COVID-19 will continue to be a, um, a, a, a challenge in January of next year. So um, we'll, we'll do what we can, um, but um, yeah, getting the, uh, taking this treaty beyond the um, government dis discussions and, and making sure that it's being reported on in the media, um, that it's being discussed on social media, 
um, mm. that there's a there's a general um, awareness around the treaty would be a, a key objective um, for us as a civil society. Um, hi, Nadine. Um, so I just like um, to add a bit um, to what um, team um, had said. Um, so you know, um, in a diplomatic um, meetings um, such as this, um, civil society normally um, hold um, side events, and hopefully, and um, hopefully that, and in this um, January meeting, you know, we'll be able to put up side events. And the the objective of this or the purpose is really to raise further awareness on the different you know aspects of the treaty. Um, also, the role of civil societies, you know, to um, approach delegates, you know, to um, lobby them, you know, to bring to them um, some ideas and how to further, you know, um, um, strengthen the treaty and its implementation. So normally um, groups like ICANN and its um, members um, meet every day, um, you know, to um, drop some ideas, you know, um, on how um, the treaty can be further um, implemented, you know, and then, you know, we bring these ideas, you know, to the delegates, um, that's what we do. So we run after them. <laughs> that's really, uh, um, you know, one of the uh, things that we do as members of civil society. So um, there are many of, of you in this call um, who were um, in the diplomatic negotiations and you have seen civil society run after you. Um, so um, we will continue to be the naggers, you know, uh, or the people who will, um, you know, like um, remind you of the heart and soul of this treaty and why it's very important um, to, um, to implement it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to our speakers for uh, responding to the questions of our audience. But in the interest of time, we have to uh, simply note the other questions and try to, to reach out to the, the ones who asked the questions and uh, uh, give some responses. But for now, we uh, proceed with the with the concluding remarks of a of our permanent representative to the Philippines, to the United Nations, His Excellency Ambassador Enrique A. Manalo. Uh, we'll, he will give us his uh, concluding remarks and synthesis for this morning's webinar. Sir? Thank you very much, uh, Marge. And uh, uh, pleasant uh, good morning slash evening to, to everyone. Uh, Secretary Loxin, Ambassador Kabaktulan, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, speakers, and uh, all participants in the webinar, I first wish to thank all of you for sharing this occasion with us as we mark the entry into force of the TPNW. And I also wish to commend the uh, United Nations uh, Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, led by uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Norlin Baja for spearheading this important and timely webinar. I'm very uh, grateful and honored to have deposited with the United Nations the instrument of ratification of the Philippines of the TPNW last uh, 18 February 2021. Of course, a great deal of groundwork had already been done by my predecessors and the Philippine mission in New York under the leadership of then permanent representative Loxin, of course now our foreign affairs secretary, provided both substantive and logistical support for the Philippine delegation that participated in the UN conference in 2017 to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons leading towards their uh, total elimination. As Secretary Loxin noted earlier, the said instrument we now call TPNW was adopted by an overwhelming vote and the Philippines was among its first signatories. After the treaty's adoption, the Philippine mission in New York pursued through and in co coordination with the Department of Foreign Affairs, the treaty's ratification by our president, President Duterte and the concurrence by the Senate highlighting the parallel efforts by member states and the United Nations to usher its entry into force. The mission also constantly engaged with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which received the Nobel Prize for its important role in building the demand for urgent action on the treaty's ratification. The mission has also spoken regularly in support of the TPNW 
in forums such as the preparatory conference or the review conference of the NPT, the UN Disarmament Commission, and the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative, or NPDI. At the General Assembly, we have supported and co-sponsored uh, the resolution on the TPNW. As advocates and knowing fully well the catastrophic humanitarian consequences that would result from the use of nuclear weapons, we are cognizant of the consequent need to completely eliminate nuclear weapons as it remains the only way to guarantee that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances. And the Philippines feels especially strongly on this advocacy, considering our constitutional mandate against the presence of nuclear weapons in our territory. Moreover, nuclear weapons in the region remain a threat also to regional peace and security. On the TPNW's entry into force, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres emphasized that, quote, the elimination of nuclear weapons remains the highest disarmament priority of the United Nations, end quote, and that there is a need for, quote, all states to work together to realize this ambition to advance common security and collective safety, end quote. Challenges, of course, remain, which include a persistently troubled geopolitical dynamics, a lack of trust and confidence among key players, and the belief by some member states that the ban treaty would undermine long-standing strategic stability. This is not new. And as early as almost 20 years ago, when I was in New York as deputy permanent representative, I recall having made a statement uh, mentioning the lack of progress in the multilateral arena of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I could repeat that again today, and it would still be accurate. Our vision now, therefore, is for TPNW to instill more urgency for nuclear disarmament, place our focus on precisely those necessary steps not implemented in the NPT. And we thank the Center for Peace Studies the ICRC and the ICANN for helping us to get this message across, for pursuing nuclear disarmament education, for keeping states in check, and for filling gaps needed to push our common agenda towards disarmament and nuclear weapons ban. It has been a very fruitful morning, and in my case, evening, well spent with all of you. There is much work ahead for us all particularly for the first meeting of the state's parties to the TPNW uh, scheduled for January next year. And I'm confident that our collective united and relentless determination will lead us to the desired outcomes that we have set out to achieve. Thank you once again, and have a pleasant day and uh, evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador P.R. Manalo, for your concluding remarks and synthesis and uh, this ends our webinar on the entry into force of the TPNW. We once again thank all our speakers, Ambassador Cabactulan, Director Ramoso, Dr. Galassi of Miriam College, Ms. Georgia Hines of ICRC, and Mr. Wright of ICANN. Thank you to all our attendees from the Philippines and from other parts of the world. We hope that this has been a productive and uh, enriching webinar for all of us. Uh, good morning and good evening to all. Thank you.